Good afternoon and welcome to the March 2023 energy market update with IGS Energy. We're going to go ahead and give everybody uh, another minute or two for those who are trying to log on coming from another meeting as I know everybody will, but we'll start very shortly. All right. Well, good afternoon again, and welcome to the March 2023 Energy Market Update with IGS Energy. A lot has happened in the energy space since our last update uh, in the late fall of 2022. Uh, this afternoon, we'll hear from Paul Ianza, IGS's Director of Gas Supply, and Joe Hagan, IGS's Senior Director on the Power Supply side. On um, what's happened during that time why and where the markets may be headed uh, from covid to the russian invasion of the ukraine then the freeport lng explosion followed by a record warm winter uh, the roller coaster of supply and demand has continued uh, as we go through the conversation this afternoon please utilize the chat uh, to send any questions that you have and i will facilitate those to our presenters as we go through uh, I realize that no one logged on today to listen to me, uh, so let's get to it, Paul. Tom, that's not true. I listen. I want to listen to you. Um, okay, well, we'll get going here. Uh, we'll start with natural gas, and then we're going to switch to power, and uh, maybe just switch it up a little bit. I'm going to go over the fundamentals, but I'm just going to fly through these pretty quickly. I really want to spend more time on volatility and I and then hit hedging um, and, uh, you know, just because so much has changed. But to uh, hit on the fundamentals, if we look at um, production, so towards the end of last year or mid last year, we, we were on 95 BCF a day uh, and we ramped up to uh, 98 BCF a day towards the end of uh, towards the end of last year. What was interesting too a little bit last year is that the Northeast producers, they typically um, you know, make a push to, um, to increase production and they did not do that this year, which was actually kind of worked out in their favor because had they done that, I think uh, you know, we'd be in a little bit more oversupplied situation than, than you know, maybe what we are right now. Uh, moving through towards this year, uh, you know, we're sticking right around that 98 BCF with some freeze offs here and there, but, you know, we're right around 97 and a half, 98 B uh, a day at this point, which is probably, you know, maybe a little bit on the strong side for us right now. Uh, I do want to just say that right now, um, the, you know, I get my data from, from Platts, uh, which everyone has kind of a, a different source, but as long as you use the same source over and over, uh, we should be fine. From the EIA, you know, they have us being right around 100 B a day, uh, but uh, e even kind of more importantly, they're projecting um, going out through the end of 2024 that we're not going to increase much. So we've had some big increases uh, over the years, uh, but right now we're going to, they're suggesting that we stay right between 99 and uh, 101 BCF a day. Um, and their numbers are going to be a little bit higher than mine uh, at this point, just given the the the, the place where I get it. Uh, to me, what's I, I guess more important is is total uh, is total net supply. So net supply is U.S. production plus Canadian imports minus exports, and this kind of gives you a, a, a nice view of how much internal supply or how much supply in the U.S. Uh, is available. 
uh, to meet the demand within the US. And if we look at this solid black line, um, which is 2022, you know, we were kind of floating right between 80 to 82 uh, BCF a day. And that proved just not to be enough supply uh, at that point. So the prices started going up in the spring and we just did not make any headway. You know, uh, the production wasn't increasing as quickly as the market wanted to, but then we, we uh, I guess you could consider it a stroke of luck if you wanted production to come up. Um, Freeport LNG went down, our net supply increases. We were up around the 84, 85 level. Production started to ramp up, and next thing you know, we're at 85, 86. Uh, but really, at this point, the damage was already done. Uh, from a uh, from a supply standpoint, we were storage was falling way behind, uh, and production just wasn't keeping up as as much as it should. And then towards the end of the year, uh, you know, we, here we are at 86, and you know everything uh, is working out well. Beginning of this year, we're at 85. Freeport is coming back online, and we're at 80, around 83 to 84 BCF a day. And just given where storage is at, it's we're probably finding ourselves in a little bit of an oversupplied uh, position, not by a lot, but um, uh, the early part of the, sp the spring is going to be instrumental in, in, in just how quickly storage is filling up, and that's going to impact the price. Uh, well, any noticed, questions before I we... noticed that I incorrectly advised our our audience to use the chat function. There's actually Microsoft knowing that we would use this uh, tool for this type of event, put a Q and A uh, option at the top as well. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A portion of the screen. Thank you. Thank you. No questions okay. as of yet, Paul. Everything's been crystal clear. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay, LNG, um, you know, back in the start of 2016, the U.S. produced basically zero uh, LNG, and over the years, uh, we've increased that to 14 BCF a day. So right now, uh, Freeport is just trying to come back. Yesterday, it was, um, uh, we were sending 1.7 B to Freeport, and this is a two BCF a day uh, uh, platform. Uh, so they're getting close to not being f full up and running. They're still in the testing part, but um, uh, but we should see 14 BCF a day. Uh, pretty, you know, boy, as far as we can see, because the prices between uh, the U.S. and in in Europe really suggest that we should see, you know, LNG run full out. Our prices are let's call it 250 to three dollars. Uh, and in Europe, they're running 13 to 14 dollars, and in 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 uh, Asia, they're running 14 to 15 dollars. So, so there's just too much money on the table uh, to not run. You know, they'll go down for maintenance when they have to. Uh, they'll go down for weather when they have to, but um, they don't really want to be down at this point. The important thing here, and the reason for this graph, is to show that you know, starting in 2024. Uh, we are going to see a couple more facilities come online, and by the end of uh, 2026, we're going to ramp up from 14 B a day to 20 BCF a day. You know, so we're going to want to remember this as we start looking at the forward curve, uh, because you know, six an additional six BCF a day uh, is 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 going to make a difference. And it's worth pointing out too that, you know, this isn't the end. This isn't. You know, by 2030, if every project was to get um, th that's out there that, that doesn't have financing, that that still has to get approvals from everything. But if every project that is out there uh, happens by 2030, we'd be up to like 28 or 29 B. Now, that's not going to happen, but by 2030, um, we could easily get to 24 to 25 BCF a day. Uh, which is which is quite frankly a lot, and it's going to really impact start impacting the back of the curve. Um, on the demand side, as Tom mentioned, you know we just haven't had much of a winter. So this map shows uh, from November one through the end of February uh, just what uh, you know just how warm we've been. 
And if you look at this from a heating degree day perspective, which means it's gas weighted, uh, a lot most of the demand is going to happen uh, in the east. You, even though it's cold, uh, you know, in the mountain area, there's just not much demand there. And quite frankly, there's not a ton of demand. There, there's a, a decent amount, but not a ton of demand uh, on the uh, on the west coast. But anyways, you know, this winter has been really a poor excuse for a winter. And right now, uh, if you just look at Novi through Feb, uh, we are the fifth warmest winter since since uh, 1950. And if you just look at the east, we're the second warmest since 1950. So uh, it's been, you know, obviously quite a bit on the warm side. One of the more kind of interesting things too is the, you know, just how power burn has been affected. So we have natural gas fired uh, generation and year after year, it's just increasing. You can look at the base load function um, in in you know uh, in the in the shoulder periods, and it's going up. You can look at the peak periods in the summer, and and it's um it's 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 going up. And what's interesting is that last summer prices were very very strong, and that's that still did not deter uh, any type of gas generation um, at uh, at this point. And um, I'll. Which is which is okay in the summertime, right? Because you know, this, if there's any flexibility uh, in the gas system, it's going to be in the summertime. But you know, more and more often, we are seeing the power burn come in during the winter. Uh, so when we were right around Christmas time, when we had that really cold snap, you know, we all of a sudden we see this giant spike uh, in power and and in power. Uh, didn't have a choice, you know, all, all the coal that could run was running, uh, so they had no choice but to call on power and and just really kind of ramp up the price. As a matter of fact, um, and, you know, right around Christmas on the 23rd, which was the peak day, uh, U.S. demand for natural gas uh, was over 160 BCF uh, for that day, and then the next day on the 24th, which is New Year's Eve, I'm sorry, Christmas Eve, we were at 152 BCF. And, and quite frankly, you know, had that not happened over Christmas, uh, those numbers would have been a lot higher. Had that happened in, let's say, a, you know, February on a Wednesday, these numbers would have gotten uh, uh, very high. And, and it didn't help either that uh, we lost about 14 BCF to freeze offs at that point. But What's happening in the winter now is 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 not good for gas. You know, there's just too much competition. There's competition for heating load. There's competition for industrial load. Uh, there's competition uh, for power demand, and there's competition for LNG at this point. Um, any questions before I move on? Paul, we did uh, receive a question asking about the expected start of Freeport exporting. I know that's uh, going to be a, a, a ramp up answer, uh, but from you and Joe, the expected start of Freeport to export again. Um, so yesterday or the day before they hit 1.7, uh, and then I believe today they were back down to, you know, uh, a third of a, a third of a BCF. So it's, it's going to be intermittent, but the plan, as far as I know, is that they have the approvals uh, to not run full out, they've they've uh, uh, they've they do have some issues that they have to work around, but they should be able to get up to two, uh, pretty close to two BCF, you know, within weeks here. At that point, now when they're up fully up and running, uh, might be about another month, you know. So they have to get, uh, they have two bursts. Uh, where there where ships can pull up and, and load. Only one of them is operational right now. And I believe they have three storage tanks uh, and only one or two of them is operational uh, right now. But for all practical purposes, you know, they're 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 trying to get up as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in from the last slide was what is a freeze off? Oh, OK, that's a that's a really good question. I'm sorry. Uh, so freeze offs when when it gets really cold outside, um, there is, you know, gas comes obviously it comes out of the ground, 
um, and it comes out at a lot of pressure. So when you add high pressure to cold temperatures, you end up the the the, the gas inside the um, the pipeline uh, starts to freeze because it's not all gas. There's there's a, a good chunk of liquid in there too. So because of all the pressure and because it's so cold, and and you know there there were you know places here in the northeast where we didn't get above zero. Um, so between between the liquid in the gas itself and the um, and, and the temperatures, it really amplifies the uh, you know gas freezing, uh, and it just at that point then just blocks the blocks the pipe, and they've got to they physically have to go out with heaters or or um, antifreeze. They have to inject antifreeze into the uh, into the pipe to sort of break things up, you know. And then you know on the other side, there's um. Uh, processing because the gas has liquids in it. It goes right to the a processing plant, and all those processing plants are, are are above ground, and they'll freeze, not easily, but uh, but they'll freeze also. So we lost gas because of the product freezing, both at the wellhead um, and and at the um, uh, and at the processing plant. Thank you. Good. OK, and then just real quickly, uh, you know, we'll go over storage here. We came uh, we came out of uh, last last winter on the low side, roughly 1.3 TCF in, uh, in, in, in gas and storage. We like to be around 1.7. 1.7 is kind of considered the comfort area. So we were below that. Uh, and we just because of you know the lack of production, we've really kind of struggled to keep up with the five year average. And we were hugging the the uh, the, the low side of the five year average. And then we got a boost when Freeport kind of went off. Uh, and the expectation was that we would ramp up to the the uh, five year average line, uh, but that didn't happen. We got uh, we ended up getting. Uh, probably you know warmer than normal in the summer, and next thing you know, we're back to hugging the uh, bottom of the five-year range. And this is when prices really kind of started to take off, uh, because the expectation or the thought was, you know, we wouldn't enter into the winter uh, with 3.6 or something anywhere even close. People were saying 3.2, 3.3, uh, which just really isn't a Great level to be at going into the winter. As it turns out, it didn't matter because we didn't get much of a winter, uh, and because of that, we're hugging the top end of the uh, of the range, and it's kind of driving prices, uh, keeping the, keeping a lid on prices for right now. Um, okay, so I wanted to get into the kind of the meat of this, which is the volatility uh, in the uh, in in hedging. So in 2022 was a record year for for volatility, and if you Kind of look at the fact that there are about 250 trading days uh, in any given year. You know, you're throwing out the weekends, you're throwing out the holidays. So you're looking at 250 days. And of those 250 days, 46 days, when you look at the change from one settlement, so it's like today's settle to tomorrow's settle, you know, just day over day change. Uh, that changed. There were 46 days where that changed by 7% or more. So what we're saying is one out of almost one out of every five days changed by 7% or more day over day. And that's crazy. And and I, I think everyone kind of on this call was living that day to day and everyone's going, hey, why are we changing? Why are we changing? And the fact is that that was just kind of the norm last year on, on you know, that just saw ups and downs, lefts and rights kind of all the time. And if you were to look at, you know, what was the absolute price change day over day, this was just the average. We were at, you know, 28 cents, basically. Uh, historically, you know, it was right around 22 cents was the uh, peak before. And we were at 7% this time. And the, the previous peak was back in 96 with only 35 days. So by any way to measure volatility, last year was... Um, Last year was probably was by far the most volatile. All right, so we're going to look at vol. We're, we're going to break this down into what is short term volatility and what is long term volatility. And the reason we're going to do that is it's going to kind of set the pace or the tenor for how long you want to 
you want to hedge, right? So, uh, so we're going to break this up in the short term and long term, and always in the short term bucket, you can throw weather. You know, so weather's always going to, uh, always going to hit, always has, always will hit. And last summer uh, was no exception. We were we were on the warmer side, uh, which kind of drove up the, which drove up the price to some extent. Um, one of the bigger causes for the short term volatility. Uh, was had to do with COVID. So if you remember in 2020, the industry, both the transportation and the en energy industry, really got hammered. Matter of fact, uh, oil prices, futures, oil futures traded negative uh, for, I believe it was two days. And oil prices just shouldn't trade negative. That's just crazy. So that shocked the producers uh, to see that. And the producers went into what they would just go into survival mode at that point. They lay off employees and they do what they can to protect cash uh, just to survive the, you know, kind of what's coming at them at that point. And then about a year and a half later, when we're coming out of COVID, you know, it was kind of a, a rapid release from COVID. Um, so all these producers had to, uh, they had to rehire the drilling crews. They had to rehire the uh, fracking crews. They had to find engineers. They had to find people uh, to buy products, and they had to go out and rent tools and stuff like this. They, you know, they had to basically hire all those people, and and, and that took time. And then when they finally had all those people, the supply chain was really, for all practical purposes, broken to a certain extent. You know, and if you want to get gas or oil out of the ground, you need a lot of steel, you need a lot of concrete, you need a lot of sand. Um, and those were hard to find. And if you did find them, uh, they they were expensive. So I'm going to chalk this up to short term volatility, but hopefully it's this is a type of volatility that we that, you know, COVID hitting and, and bringing it, you know, everyone to their knees. Hopefully that doesn't happen again, but I'm going to say it's somewhat short term. If we look at the long term volatility, uh, the, the very first one is storage. If you go back to 2000, the beginning of 2017, the US produced 70 BCF, 70 billion cubic feet a day. And recently we've hit 100 BCF a day. So that is a 40% increase in a matter of six years, basically. So our industry as a whole increased by 40%, but storage didn't increase at all. And as a matter of fact, storage hasn't increased uh, to, to, you know, to any meaningful level uh, in the past decade. So the one asset, storage is about the only asset that gas has um, that's going to smooth out the daily, monthly, and seasonal swings. So if you increase your, your industry by 40%, you're going to max out on those swings. You know, you're going to hit your limits both to the high side and the low side, and that's going to create a lot of volatility. You're going to see it in the day market first, and quite frankly, we've already seen that. And then you're going to start to see that, you know, kind of creep in uh, to uh, to really kind of potentially wreak havoc on the longer term side. Um, next is, you know, looking at gas generation. You, you cannot increase production by 40% without doing something to the demand side. So that's something on the demand side. The first thing on the demand side that we saw was an increase in gas-fired uh, generation for the power sector. Uh, so gas-fired generation was increasing by, by leaps and bounds, and it was knocking coal uh, out of the stack. And as a matter of fact, for you know, over the last decade, we've seen uh, coal retirements at the pace of, you know, roughly, you know, half. So what the, the coal industry 10 years ago um, was X and now we're, we're um, half of that uh, right now. In the short term, that's perfectly fine uh, for, for natural gas. Uh, you know, during this transition period, because when you need gas for heating or increased industrial load, the price of gas rises uh, to the extent that it brings coal back into the power stack and the power stack says, hey, gas, you're just too expensive for me. Um, why don't you, go, you know, go ahead and take care of the, of the heating side and everything works perfectly. Everyone's happy at that point. Um, 
but coal then hit a point where there just wasn't enough coal in the stack to take the you know to 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 give gas that freedom to go do other things and we started noticing that in um in uh 2021 2021 so um uh, uh so anyways we um uh we saw that it was it was power then that was that was driving the price of natural gas and heating and industrial demand was was just along for the ride uh we, then in, in 2022 we saw that it just didn't matter what the price was uh at that point uh you know it power needs power needs um the uh, uh the, the the gas for generation and it um uh it didn't matter the price. This year, we're seeing this sort of swooshy thing, which is at low prices, whatever coal's out there, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to knock that out of the stack. All right, um, and then exports too. Uh, we've known that LNG uh, in 2016 was zero. Uh, it's 14 BCF a day now. This just adds one more thing competing for gas, uh, for natural gas into the equation. OK, so what does this mean for for hedging at, at this point? So it used to be, you know, you could lock in your prices uh, for one year in September. You could avoid the hurricanes. You could avoid uh, the potential of cold weather. And then next September, you could do the same thing. But because we have all these longer term, um, you know, kind of volatility factors coming in, we need to take a longer term approach. And that longer term approach is hedging three to five years, um, you know, just having a horizon that's three to five years. And more importantly, you want to have the first year completely hedged um, at that point. And then when we get some dips, you can look further out the curve to year two and year three. And either you can, when we get those dips, you can take them out um, or, or, you know, take out layers at that point. So, the first thing we want to do in this kind of situation is to say, what is the fair price for natural gas? What is the long term fair price for natural gas? And I have two curves here. One is the blue one is from uh, late November uh, in this kind of orangey one is from is from mid February. So, you know, kind of looking towards this part of the graph to get because this this front part of the graph isn't going to tell you what the really the fair value is for gas. It's going to tell you what gas is worth, you know, for the upcoming season or the month. Uh, so we want to look towards this part of the curve, you know, four and five years out to see what the market is telling us. So in November, the market was telling us, you know, the fair price for gas was around 450. And in mid February, it was three, you know, it was telling us, hey, we're at 390. So if we call uh the fair price for natural gas anywhere between basically four dollars and 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 four dollars and 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 fifty cents you know now we can start to work backwards a little bit to figure out you know how are we going to set our you know at what price do we feel comfortable layering in when we have the opportunity uh again you want to have the, the the first year to year and a half taken care of because you want to avoid this whole section right here. There's just too much volatility. And if you say, hey, Paul, hey, I've locked in at 350, 350, 360, 370. I'm missing out on the opportunity to get this 250 gas here. Um, you know, is there a way that I can participate in that? And, and the answer is, in this case, when you, when you do this, the answer is no. But if you're losing sleep over this, then we just kind of throw this hedging methodology out and look at something that's more options related uh, at that point. And quite frankly, my guess is you're not going to like that options standpoint because there's just um, uh, because because of all the volatility, options are really expensive at this point. Um, we're going to talk about two. Any questions before I go on to this? I'm I'm going to try and hit on 
like what we expect in the future. Uh, for None that have come through since the last one, Paul, but I'm sure some of these slides will have some questions to come with them and I'll, I'll pause. You okay, there. so um, I'm splitting up the curve into three different parts. You know, the front part of the curve, uh, the mid part, and then the, uh, the, the, uh, the longer term part. And if you kind of look at what the market is is trying to tell us, we have this steep awkward curve on cash prices right now. I mean, if you're to go out and buy gas for tomorrow, you're right around this, you know, 240 type price. It's actually below uh, below April. So the so this curve has to figure out how do I get from 240 to whatever I consider the fair value to be. Let's call it 425, just to put a number on it. Um, and the and it, it it has to connect because it's it's futures and and you can um, you can buy cash today and you know sell it later, uh, so you just can't have this giant disconnect where cash is trading at two forty and next thing you know, you know April's trading at four dollars. It just doesn't kind of work that way. So the, this curve is set up for a couple different reasons. One, the the very front price, the very front part of the curve is low because it's trying to find demand in all this. So at 250, it's going to get more demand uh, from the power sector than if it was at 350. You know, it's a whole job now is to knock coal out of the stack. Um, if it's not able to do that, what's going to happen is we're going to start putting a lot of gas into storage. Uh, and if that happens early on, you're going to see this part of the curve really start to go down also at, at that point, because the last thing that this that we want to do is fill up storage uh, by September and not have any room to inject in you know October uh, in November. And it's going to do whatever it can to protect itself and it's going to uh, uh, drop pretty quickly. And that's going to bring part two down. Um, but just to hit on part three. Uh, you know, with all of the LNG coming on at this point in time, it's it's hard to say that, you know, is 425 a good, you know, a good solid uh, fair value. You could really make the argument that we should be over five dollars. You know, if we're if if the production has to ramp up, if if the infra pipeline infrastructure uh, ha has to ramp up. Uh, is that going to happen in an orderly fashion? And you can look at the history and say, well, it's probably not going to happen in an orderly fashion. So we're going to have a lot of volatility in this part when new infrastructure is coming on. There's going to be a lot of producers that want to fill up that infrastructure. And there's a really good chance that not only is the front part of the curve here going to be um, heavy on the supply side and light on the demand side, there's a good chance that the second part, this medium part, has as producers are increasing to fill up new pipes that are waiting for the construction to happen of the LNG, there's a good chance that that's going to be over um, uh, oversupplied also. Uh, so personally, I like the back of the curve, you know, anywhere, if anywhere below four dollars, I like the back of the curve and that's 26 and 27 especially and you know maybe into 25 also i'm not you know i can be talked into either way on this i mean th th this part of the curve is really trying to find its way uh at, at this point um and then i can just to sort of summarize just real quickly since i'm again i'm just kind of going over time and i apologize for that um from a from a uh, summary perspective uh last year just due to COVID, it took a while for the producers to ramp up. Uh, they need to hire fracking crews. The supply chain was broken, um, and uh, the producers were kind of slow to respond uh, at that point. What the industry is kind of looking at now, which is even a little bit more awkward, is because storage um, is is you know because we don't have the abundance of storage based on the size of the industry that it uh, that we used to. Uh, the uh, producers are becoming the new balancing agents of the industry, and they, quite frankly, uh, haven't necessarily done that before in a short term environment. They've done it in a medium term environment in a long term environment, but they haven't done it in a short term uh, environment. Um, 
you know, right now it feels like the uh, current uh, uh, net supply is is supply outpacing demand, uh, but weather and LNG is is, is going to have a big say in in what that looks like for the balance of of, of this year. Uh, by 2027, uh, in the LNG buildouts, uh, we should start to see demand outpacing supply at that point. Uh, and when that happens, there's still there's going to be LNG out there. You know, the power industry is go isn't going anywhere. We're still going to need heating. Uh, you know, gas for heating demand and industrial demand. So we're we're going to start to see that part of the curve become uh, much more volatile. And like I say, I you know anything below four bucks, I tend to like out there. Um, and because volatility has shifted from short-term cycles to uh, longer-term cycles too. And I didn't have time to touch on this, but we are seeing all of the expansions, whether it's pipeline or whether it's production, all of that's happening in the South Central area, you know, the Texas, Louisiana, you know, some of it shoots up into Oklahoma, some, some of the production shoots up into uh, uh, New Mexico, but that part of the uh, uh, of the industry is really beefing itself up. And what's right in the middle of that, that whole area is the Henry Hub. So what we could potentially see in the next four or five years is that the Henry Hub is going to become more connected to LNG and less connected to the rest of the United States. And, and that's kind of important from the standpoint of if and when that happens, um, you're not only is your NYMEX going to be volatile, but your basis, uh, but your uh, basis or the difference between the Henry Hub and let's say Ohio, that number is going to be um, become much more volatile also. So I will stop there because I apologize. I've gone over and Joe needs to get a chance. Hey, Paul, before before we go to Joe, there's a, a follow up question uh, yeah. asking why do uh, liquefied natural gas buildouts suggest that demand will outpace supply? Um, that's a really good question. So I would say that historically, gas has not been a, has not done a good job keeping up with demand when demand was the driver. So you could go back and you could say, hey, between 2011 and 2021 for that 10 year period, supply was always outpacing demand. And because of that, demand had to sort of pop up to absorb all this supply. We're going to flip that and demand is going to be there. And now we have to um, now now supply has to then uh, jump up to to get that and the infrastructure has to happen. Uh, on the producer side, kind of what we've seen because of COVID and because you know, we supply ramped up so quickly, we knocked a lot of producers, uh, you know, just really out of the game, so to speak. A lot of them went bankrupt. So what we're left with is we are left with uh, the, the the large producers, the publicly traded producers, and the very very large independent producers, and we're finding that they're being you know, a little bit more uh, centralized in their decision making. Um, and and I don't think we're going to see this, you know, massive drilling that really has to happen because of all this demand come on. And it's it's sort of the opposite of what happened last year. But that's a really good question. And again, that's just my opinion. I, you know, it could be wrong, um, but if I had to if I had to own gas, out the curve at four dollars. I own it at you know in 2026, 20, 27, and not in necessarily in 24. Thank you. Joe, it looks like it's your turn. Great. Can you guys see uh does it look like a PowerPoint's up here? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, so to start, I just wanted to kind of talk about pricing volatility over the past several years and how it ties back to natural gas. So what we've really seen in the U.S. is a shift away from um, coal plants, most a lot of nuclear plants, and really um, a lot of the U.S. is shifting to a, a renewables-based uh, generation stack with natural gas as a reliability uh, instrument. So this is the prompt month power 
prices going back since 2018. The blue line would be kind of like the Ohio region and the orange line would be Massachusetts. And I, and I brought up these examples for some very specific reasons. Um, Massachusetts is tied very close to the price of LNG. And the reason that is, is there isn't enough pipeline infrastructure in place to ship gas all the way from, you know, Pennsylvania, where there's a lot of it up into Massachusetts. So it relies on LNG. So when Paul mentions that at some point in the future with the LNG build out, we could be seeing a situation where Henry Hub is more tied to LNG. We've got an example here of this, this orange line of what could happen to power prices that are tied to LNG. Um, and so what you see is that, you know, over the past five, six, seven winters, you see this small bumps, but really with the volatility we saw in, the, in gas prices over the past year, the volatility in what we saw in Europe um, and Asia, uh, you can see just kind of that impact and what it has to power prices as we go through the winter. Uh, and, and so that's those two big orange spikes. That's the past two winters that we that we saw right there. Now, if you look at this blue line right here, this is kind of the Ohio region. I thought it was kind of a good indicator of just kind of average prices in the US, especially the Midwest. Um, and what you see is that prices were very tied to natural gas um, as the Ukraine war started, uh, as volatility started, and then this sharp decline right here in prices. This was really driven by Freeport LNG terminal coming offline. So it would have been interesting to see how high prices would have been in the Midwest had we not had that LNG terminal come offline and really kind of trap gas in the area. But then you look at kind of the end of the chart here and we're back down to some of these lows that we've seen uh, for a really long time. Now the biggest driver behind that really has to do with weather. Uh, weather's kind of the trump card that can drive a lot of different things. Um, but if you look at you know the left side of this chart, that would be the January we had uh, last year, 2022. Um, so a little over a year ago, it was very cold. Uh, it was a colder winter, colder end of winter especially. Um, and then on the right was, you know, as Paul mentioned, one of the the warmest Januarys we've had in history. Uh, I wasn't going to spend too much time talking about weather, but it definitely is impactful. Uh, and it's really what kind of drove this big drop off here in the curves over the past you know, month or so. But I did mention, you know, we're kind of in a grid that's shifting between different resources. Um, uh, so what you see on the left is the generation share going back since 2019 in the PJM region. Um, for those who don't know, PJM is the regional area of the power markets that starts in Chicago, goes through Ohio, Pennsylvania, and part of the East Coast. Uh, and so you can see there, it's um, not a lot has changed over the past four years, but there has been some change, primarily with a decrease in this blue stack here, uh, which would be coal, and an increase in the share of natural grass, gas, which is this orange chart here. Um, but you can see just, you know, from two Januarys, taking a snapshot in time, really all that's happened is if you've seen uh, coal here shift to natural gas, um, and natural gas really taking up this share of coal retirements, and we haven't had a ton of renewables in, in this portion of the U.S. Uh, compared to some other regions. But we do know there are areas in the United States where there has been a lot of renewable generation built out, uh, and one of those Primary examples would be in ERCOT, um, which is the, the Texas area. Uh, and so what you can see right there is, um, you know, just looking at the renewables on uh, January 2019, renewables served about 13% of the demand. Uh, and then over the course of four years, huge build out of solar and wind. And on this day in 2023, it served about almost 50% of the demand. And really all that's being backstopped with reliability by natural gas. So you'll see, um, you know, if there's a, a lot of renewables on the grid at any time, gas really is the one that goes down um, in, in its output. Uh, and so, but if the renewables aren't able to produce, then natural gas is really what um, makes that backstop. Um, and so I'm kind of bringing these two examples. I'm going to hit on these a little bit because it's almost like a situation where in PJM, you're looking at a very legacy type grid where there are a lot of large generations still in the stack. When ERCOT, you're looking at almost like the direction that the grid is headed. 
uh, with more renewables on the grid and utilizing natural gas power plants as as that reliability backstop. Uh, and, I, and I think that the reason I say that is looking at, you know, what plants are coming offline and what plants are coming online. Um, this is just a, a table that was put together by the EIA to talk about generation stack changes in the United States over the next year. And you can see solar wind batteries are all growing in uh, new capacity on the grid. And that's really at the detriment of coal and some of the older natural gas plants. Um, and so, you know, like we just talked about how we're shifting to more of a, a Texas based generation stack. That's really what the utility scale planning is telling me, uh, and that's why I believe that. Pause for a second and you can jump into a couple of specific examples on what happens. Cool. Um, so let's just Joe, look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we talked about PGM and ERCOT. Uh, are, are, can you can you say besides the PJM and ERCOT, any other examples of other ones around the country? Since I know there's people uh, from different parts of the country on this call. Um, sure, yeah, uh, so let see the question, what is PJM and ERCOT? So they are the goal of regional transmission organizations, which is what they are, is to get benefits of scale between utilities and allow independent power producers to come and bid their power plants into market. So their goal is to create, um, and they're really nonprofit organizations, a marketplace where they, they can forecast the amount of demand they'll need at any location, and they can dispatch generation based off of a cost uh, to meet that demand. And then wherever that supply and demand curve uh, cross each other is, is how the market is created and what sets that price. Some other examples would be, um, there's one called ISO New England, uh, which is the Northeast. It's um, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Uh, another example would be the Mid-Continent ISO, uh, which is another regional marketplace that goes all the way, basically the middle of the continent from Canada all the way in, until you get to Texas. Did that answer that question? I think so, that was great. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's look at a couple days and what this can do to markets. Um, so this, you know, if I were a uh, maybe more creative person, I could come up with a better title of, of this love story here between two Valentine's days. Um, but in 2021, Texas saw some of the uh, coldest uh, weather that it has seen um, over his, history's time period. Uh, and, and in that time period, uh, they weren't getting in a, it was in the middle of winter, so there wasn't as much solar as they would hope for. And wind had some issues as well. It wasn't, it wasn't as windy. It was a very, it was one of those big cold fronts that comes through where it's almost like the air just kind of stands still, still. Uh, and so that was really all kind of backstopped with natural gas. Um, so, you know, 60% of the demand during that day was backstopped by natural gas, but there were a lot of issues on that side as well. Uh, and due to some of the rolling blackouts and things, the average price of energy on that day was around $9,000. So if you have a grid that's going through extreme weather, that's having issues getting natural gas plants online due to weather, that isn't getting the renewable build out delivering to the same level that it could, you end up with very high prices. Now, if you look at what happened this past Valentine's Day, it was really warm and the wind was just blowing. Uh, so half the grid power in Texas on that day uh, a couple weeks ago was served by, you know, basically wind generation. Uh, and, and so because wind does not have a variable cost, it'll just turn on for no matter what the price of power is. It really kind of puts a, a cap on where prices can go. Um, and so we ended up with very low prices that day. And so the real lesson that you can kind of take away from here is, is if, if you're in a region that has a lot of renewables and um, is using natural gas as a backstop, you can see a lot of volatility, very low prices as well as very high prices. Um, it, so that's one thing to keep in mind as we look at how the grid is going to behave in the future. Um, Uh, the next is PJM, so kind of this Midwest region between Chicago and uh, Pennsylvania. Um, we had the polar vortex of 2014, which for years was one of the coldest spells that we had had. 
Uh, and so I went and took a look at, you know, what do prices do during that time period, you know, nine years ago? Um, and the average price during that those that day those days was about four hundred and thirty two dollars, which is still pretty high. Um, but you still had a decent amount of coal in the stack. And you still had a lot of a lot of things there to deliver. Now, f fast forward, you know, seven, eight years uh, to the stack that we have in place today. And we, over the uh, Christmas holiday, we had a very similar weather pattern breakout. Um, and there were different rules that I'll talk about in place to make sure plants are reliable in that time period. Uh, but the average price was more than double. So how can you have this shifting generation stack, similar weather, end up with um, very different prices? Uh, and, and that all has to do with kind of the, the tie to delivered natural gas. And when I say delivered natural gas, you can talk about the Henry Hub that Paul talked about. And then how do you get it either from, you know, Louisiana up into the Midwest, or how can you utilize the production that's in kind of Pennsylvania, the east side of Ohio, and, and get that delivered? Um, because during those time periods, you're really competing for other resources, like Paul talked about, like um, building heating, things like that. Uh, so I thought this was a really good example of how you can have a, a changing dispatch stack that relies more on natural gas that can see higher prices than you would have seen historically. So not so a good example of how um, past results don't necessarily forecast what can happen into the future. Um, so we talked about two kind of things that can happen on the grid. One is, you know, how low prices can go with a lot of renewables and mild weather. The other with how high prices can go when you have a lot of natural gas uh, and extreme weather. Um, but what really happened over the Christmas break brought to light a couple things. And I know Paul, Paul talked about this a little bit about, uh, you know, what price will generators pay to generate power? Uh, or what price will generators pay for natural gas um, in order to before they start to shut down? Uh, and the chart on the left here is is an example of if you look at kind of this dark blue line right here, this would be 2017, and this is kind of traditionally what you would expect. As the price goes up, the percentage of generation served by natural gas should go down. And what that's telling me is that if prices of gas are too high, we're replacing our generation resources with something else. And in that case, it was most likely coal. Um, but what we've seen really over the past couple of years is that as price goes up, um, those natural gas generators are just still there. They're still willing to pay for that gas. And, and that's contributing directly to uh, some of the higher prices that we've seen on, in energy um, over the past couple of years. But look at what happened over this winter. So I, t I t said there were some rule changes that came after the polar vortex. So the polar vortex of 2014, there was a lot of generation outages. Um, they were having issues getting them all online, and they came back and said, like, if we're paying you for reliability and you don't deliver, we are going to hit you with a very stiff penalty. And, you know, over the course of the past, you know, six, seven, eight years, that hadn't really happened uh, in any large widespread area, except over this past Christmas, uh, really the 23rd, 24th of December. Um, and we saw a lot of generation plants, especially natural gas plants, weren't able to get gas delivered because of the freeze offs Paul talked about. And um, all of those plants right now are getting hit with a, a bill and they haven't released final numbers, but they've estimated it to be between one to $2 billion in, in penalties. Um, so we've kind of, Extra, ex, extrapolated that out because you know with this elasticity thing if it seems like hey at 950 plants are going to shut down what sort of price would plants shut down at and, and looking at the way penalties are instilled on these plants we really need to get natural gas to go upwards to 185 dollars plus per mmbtu in order to get any sort of natural gas pullback to where their penalties would be less than paying for the gas so you can kind of see you know gas in this 950 range that was a delivered gas price it really needs to go a pretty wide stretch to the right on this chart in order to get any sort of reaction on uh, natural gas plants um, so i've talked about the, the stack a little bit uh, i'd be remiss to not talk a little bit about the inflation reduction act because what that is really doing is that uh, shift that we saw in the generation stack from you know coal big base load units to more renewables backed by natural gas is really going to be accelerated by this across the Midwest. 
Um, I stole this both of these charts, but the chart on the left really talks about spending from the IRA. Um, and I know the font's small. Don't worry about you know exactly what it says. All that's really important for this chart is what's in that big dark green uh, section of spending. And that's all wind, solar, and storage. So all of a sudden, the people who are developing wind and who are developing other renewables like solar are getting a big infusion of cash, basically, to, to help them build this generation stack out more quickly. Uh, and you know there can only be so many plants on the grid, so who really comes at the detriment of this spending in its coal retirements? So you know because of the inflation, Re inflation Reduction Act, I think we're taking this trend that we saw and really starting to, to escalate that and have it happen a little more quickly than it probably would have otherwise. Uh, so that's on the supply stack side, but this act is really impacting the demand side as well. Uh, and so this is something I'm paying pretty close attention to um, because as part of this act, there are two big chunks. One is what they're calling high efficiency home rebates. Uh, so there are very big rebates that go for things such as heat pumps. So switching from natural gas heat to electric heat, uh, you can get a big rebate for that. Um, electric stoves uh, and also a, a big electric vehicle tax credit of uh, $7,500 for a lot of vehicles. Um, so what's that telling me that, is that a lot of people are going to be using more electricity today than they had before. And so that really changes the demand side of that equation. I think previously everything I've talked about is really the supply side, but this is really demand side. And so what does that do to customers? So if you look at an average customer today on this chart on the left, it's really, this is a residential customer. It's really those blue bars. The average customer uses about 10,000 kilowatt hours annually, but overnight, if they come in, get a, an electric heat pump and an electric vehicle, you know, they can really double their usage of electricity um, really in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, and, and so when I talk, so when you think about that on more of like a widespread, a lot of spending through the, the IRA, a lot of customers switching over to using more electricity, we're now highly impacting the, the demand side of this equation. Uh, so just to summarize, um, the power generation stack is really in a transitional period. Some parts of the US are a little ahead of others, and we, and we can really use those as kind of bellwether on where we think energy prices are going to go during volatile time periods. Um, because natural gas, the technology behind natural gas plants allows them to be so flexible, uh, they, you know, a natural gas plant can come online in 10 minutes, a coal plant can take 12 hours. Um, so some of those reasonings are why those plants are going to continue to be uh, important in the stack and why power prices are going to be tied directly to natural gas prices. Um, so if you're uh, looking at a natural gas curve and you think that's a really good price, the power prices are, are going to be similarly set and you should be looking at those uh, concurrently. The other thing is the, the IRA is really going to increase the rate of the transition, um, both towards renewables, um, but also increases in the, the demand for power. Uh, and what this really tells me is that risk management is going to become importantly, increasingly important um, you know, looking at these areas where you can have higher highs, lower lows in prices, uh, creates a situation where you really want to understand the grid and get a, a risk management structure in place to help you manage that. I'll stop sharing there. I know we only have a couple minutes, but I am here to I can take questions. Thank you, Joe. Uh, right now, yes, the the question and answer a portion of our commentary is still open. Uh, as you're thinking about questions from the presentation today, uh, please remember we pride ourselves on the customized approach that we have for each of one of our clients' needs. If you do have questions that you have not put into the chat that you want to talk about based on your timeline, your usage, your contracts, and your budget, please reach out to your IGS representative who you work with uh, to get those questions answered. And if they're not able to, they can certainly communicate with both Paul and Joe on on anything that's coming down. Uh, the last question that we have in the chat here uh, from Marinko is, do you see nuclear growing in the coming years? That's a loaded question with yeah. one minute left. Um, high level, not a lot. 
there's a couple of very specific reasons. Um, and not that I'm against nuclear. I think that, that it definitely has a place in our generation stack, but a couple of challenges that have come in. in is, one of them is the latest nuclear plant to come online, which I think it maybe did just like very recently um, down uh, in Southeast United States, ran about $16 billion over budget the last I checked. Um, so it just becomes very expensive. Uh, and so when you can build a renewable paired with natural gas or even battery storage, where I think it could grow as well, um, it becomes much more cost effective to do that than to build nuclear. Uh, the other issue I, I've really seen, and this has kind of come up recently, has to do with the workforce. People who knew how to build nuclear plants are really beginning to age out of the workforce. And you just aren't seeing a, since there hasn't been new nuclear plants built, you don't have a lot of people who actually know how to do it. Um, so very high priced uh, compared to other resources. Not a lot of people actually know how to build them still uh, or t these days. Um, and a lot of alternative resources get all the attention and uh, seem to be more cost effective. Um, I think we can we can all agree anytime project runs 16 billion over uh, probably deserves a little bit of attention uh, the next time you're at the drawing table. Thank you, Joe, for for those final comments. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, please use this as a catalyst for more conversation to have questions answered. Uh, we're never going to tell you that the market's going to go up 100% or that it's going to go crash down. Uh, sounds like the, the theme is volatility is, is probably a, a new environment that we should get used to. Uh, and, and we hope to be a partner with you uh, to get through this time and help you manage your energy costs to the best way possible. Uh, thanks again, and we appreciate all of your business and partnership.